Welcome to the Seahawks Man to Man podcast powered by Blue Wire. Shout out to the new company. My name is Michael Sean Dugar. You guys can follow me on whatever Elon Musk is calling that app these days. That my name on there has not changed at Mike Dugar. That's M I K E D U G A R. Shout out to everyone who is watching or listening on our YouTube channel. Seahawks Man to Man is the name of the channel. That's Seahawks Man to Man, man, the number two man. Uh, if you're just listening right now on the audio on Spotify, Apple, Blue Eye, whatever, please just go over to YouTube real quick, hit the subscribe button or the like, whatever, and just come right back. That's all. We just appreciate that love and support when you guys do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Chris, go ahead and talk to him. What is going on, everybody? It's been a minute, but we're back. We appreciate all the love and support. You can follow me on Twitter at CKIDD206 and that's CKID206. And if you are new, we have the on the YouTube for our YouTube viewers on the bottom. We have a ticker roll and you can see where we're where you can find us. It's Apple, Spotify, Blue Wire. All of it's there available for you. So if you're new and subscribe to YouTube, we appreciate all the love and support. All right. We're back uh, with a guest as we get into our kind of pre-draft post free agency bag. Uh, I am glad to welcome back joining us. Uh, I don't know how many times he's been on, but this ain't the first time we're having him back. Uh, appreciate it. The homie from The Athletic, Deontay Lee. Deontay, welcome back, brother. How you doing? I'm good, man. I think this is year three now. I think I, I came, my first yes. year was my was while I was working at PFF and then mm. I was the last two years working at the athletic. So definitely appreciate y'all having me on the talk ball. Oh yeah. No, nah, man. We talked at the combine when I just seen you. Like I love talking ball, man. I, I learned so much uh from reading something you write or uh or just just when we talk or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you're part of the reason I was a big Brian Branch guy going into last year's draft. Mm. Uh, I think we spent a lot of time talking when I did uh, my Pete Carroll piece ahead of the 2022 season when um, Clint, when um, Clint Hurt took over as D.C., right? And you had Sean Desai as a DB's coach, and they were kind of trying to find a way to mix in some of the Fangio stuff with what they were what they already had with their 4-3 stuff. So yeah, we definitely had a lot of time talking ball with one another, man, so I'm glad to be back on. All right, man. I uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you joining us uh, for this installment of Seahawks man to man. Uh, the Seahawks really shook up their linebacker and their safety rooms. You know, they basically let Jordan Brooks go to Miami, get his bag, let Bobby Wagner go to the commanders and reunite with Ken Norton Jr. And Dan Quinn uh, right. over there in D.C. Uh, they cut Jamal Adams in the name of cash. Uh, they cut Quandre Diggs also in the name of cash. So they re <laughs> revamped that whole situation brought in Tyrell Dotson, brought in uh, Jerome Baker, brought in Kevon Wallace, brought in Rayshon Jenkins. Uh, we're going to start, uh, I want to kick this off looking at the free agent guys. And we'll start with the first guy they signed, since that's the easiest, we'll just go in order. Uh, it's Tyrell Dotson from, from Buffalo. Uh, you know, played. he was a undrafted guy, a smaller cat, looks in 235-ish uh, range, off-ball, kind of weak side guy over there. Uh, Seahawks gave him a pretty cheap deal, reportedly with a base of $4.2 million, worth up to about you know $5 million. Uh, so let's kick things off with him. I got a two-parter for you with, uh, with Tyrell. One, okay. what did you see from him in Buffalo? And two, what do you expect to see from him in a Mike McDonald scheme in Seattle? Um, in Buffalo, when you look right, like the first thing I'm looking at with linebacker is coverage ability in the league, right? I want to see how you're being used, how teams use you in coverage. And I would say his role was kind of limited from that perspective. A lot of covering backs out into the flat, a lot of playing into the boundary or playing on the weak side. Um, you know, Buffalo, I think is a, was more of a zone coverage team, you know, kind of soft zone than match zone or playing man to man. So, you're seeing him play with a lot of depth. I would say for being a 235 guy, and I think this may just be the trend of the league, right? Is that we're not just we're just not gonna see that many 240, 245 plus pound guys. He's kind of more of like your linear thumper type, 
right? Like if I had to guess, taking what I saw in Buffalo and trying to translate it into what he would be doing with Mike McDonald, I think you'll see him kind of in that Patrick Queen role, so to speak, right? A lot of blitzes, a lot of setting up stunts for your defensive linemen, um, a lot of kind of just like one gap fit downhill, just go be a tackler. And he is a pretty proficient tackler, right? Like, especially out in space, I would say that he's about, he's about, he's probably about above average as a tackler out in space. You're not going to get a transformative guy from him as a linebacker, but he's a guy who can do a little bit of everything and somebody that you can kind of turn your back on and know, Hey, he's going to be productive tackling out in space. We can put him on a back and he can cover that. He can play soft zone. And I think that as we kind of continue in this conversation, we're going to talk a lot about just being more of a soft zone team. Cause if I'm going by their signings, I think that's kind of what they're signaling is that they don't think this is going to be a man heavy type of defense. Now, following up with Mr. Tyrell here, the Seahawks, they have an opportunity to really change their dynamic and how they run their defense. No more Bobby. He's older, obviously, and they don't bring in, they don't retain Jordan Brooks, unfortunately. So with that being said, PFF, they have Terrell ranked as the number one linebacker in the NFL. Do you agree with that assessment? That's a little, a little steep for me. That's a little <laughs> steep for me. <laughs> Definitely a little steep for me. I, I understand, you know, having worked there, I can understand how the grades can work out for him, right? Like I said, He's a proficient tackler. The dude doesn't miss tackles. And then his coverage role is pretty limited. So from the perspective of executing what he's been asked to do, you'll see that he can do that more often than not. I think the issue is just like projecting. Like you said, there's not going to be a Jordan Brooks coming back, which I think would have given him a little bit of an easier role, right? Because I think Brooks is rangy. Obviously, he's improved as a coverage player in each of the last few years. And I think can probably be a pro bowl, all pro level guy in the right system. Um, based on where his projection and where he's tracking as a player. So not having a guy beside you like that to help kind of erase some of the bigger problems, that's um, that's more concerning, I, I would say. Definitely not the number one linebacker in the <laughs> NFL, but a useful role player type of guy. And I think that, like, again, as we talk about their free agent signings, I think that that was kind of the mark of all the guys that they're bringing in on the defensive side. When you were talking about Terrell, you mentioned something called the soft zone. And for a lot of listeners, even maybe myself and Mike, we're wondering, can you clarify what exactly that is in the scheme and what the defense might be asking him to do? So I would say like soft zone, this is actually a good conversation to have with Seattle, right? Like soft zone mean can mean a few different things if we're talking specific coverages, right? If you're thinking cover three, you're thinking about playing with a lot of depth, allowing the ball to be thrown on check downs, rallying and going to make the tackle, right? So I would say, like, if you watch the Texans last year, the 49ers under D'Amico Ryans a few years before that, I would call them a soft zone team. And, like, it's not a it's not a, a pejorative or, or um, a backhanded compliment to say a team plays soft zone. The idea behind it is that you're trying to take away explosive passes down the field. And that's the way the Buffalo played, I would say. that, And I would say that that's probably the way things are tracking to go for Seattle under Mike McDonald, at least in year one. All right, here we go. See, we're getting deep into the weeds of the ball talk. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Because right. also we we're still in the like the the mysterious stage with Mike McDonald, you know, like he did his introductory press conference, but no one's really gonna get into the weeds there. He's done a few radio and TV interviews, but those serve a different purpose, you know. He's kind of endear himself to the local market. There's bills to pay locally, right. so you gotta <laughs> knock out, you know, the flagships uh in, in your local market, and then he skipped the combine. So it's like ain't nobody really heard from uh, from from do yet he all he's really said is that uh he's going to be a three four under team and then john snyder i guess let it slip that there'll be more too high uh but that's yep. kind of all we got so uh get a chance to talk to uh mike mcdonald this week at the owners meetings let me see if i can get him to nerd out you know coaches, you love, coaches love talking ball uh yeah i i, I knew you wouldn't think he was the number one linebacker yeah. PFF, <laughs> pff is so it's so funny sometimes when we cling on we we've seen it in seattle a few times where the you can tell fans are just like, ooh, PFF likes him, so he must be nice. It happened with uh, – Chris, remember what happened with Quentin Dunbar when they traded for him? Oh, man. In, uh, mm, I want to say 2019, I think it was. It was. Where he yes. was really, like, rock solid, and PFF yeah. was really high on him. Seahawks fans had watched no Commanders games, right, because why would they? So would PFF, <laughs> PFF was like, ooh, he nice, and then right. it just didn't come to fruition. And then I think two years ago or last year – like Ryan Neal, I think was PFF's number Ryan, one. Ryan, yeah, Ryan Neal's a good one for that. Yeah, yeah, and then it was like in Seattle, it was like, huh, he was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like Ryan, but I, I remember seeing the ranking. I was like, huh, 
really? Okay, good for him. <laughs> I do. Well, I mean, I guess, and that's always a problem when you're using like one number analytics, right? Is that you have to remove a lot of context from that. Like, so like you said, it's always going to be a fan's best friend. It's always going to be an agent's best friend because you can go look and say, hey, he was a 80 point whatever that ranks in the top eight at his position. And, you know, if you're playing defensive line and you're a top 10 lineman, it's one thing to have that number next to you. But if they're not asking you to be a top 10 lineman type of player, then what does the number really tell you, right? Like mm. that's something that people have to keep in mind. Just because you were at 85, maybe at your last stop, doesn't mean that you're as good as Aaron Donald was, right? Like that's that that's the thing that people have to keep in mind. Like I said, serviceable player, which is why he grades well. He does what he's asked to do pretty well. He's just not asked to do very much in terms of like the scope of the defense, especially at that position. And in the context of Ryan specifically, how t- how fans feel about Jamal Adams versus right. That ranking, it was like it made for a real nasty discourse locally. Exactly. I to partake because it was a lot of bad faith. But I remember thinking, "Oh, that's just gonna only make this worse." Uh, <laughs> that really because uh, PFF also never is really high on Jamal right. uh, last, last few years or Quandre for that matter. We'll get to the safeties a little later. Let's move on to the next linebacker. Mm-hmm. Um, they signed, picked up Mike linebacker Jerome Baker from the Dolphins. Uh, dealt with a few injuries last year, hurt his wrist. Uh, towards the end of the year, reportedly signed on a one-year deal worth up to $7 million. The word worth up to, we're doing a lot of work in free agency yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, the last, last like week, every deal was like worth up to, insert amount. And then Mike Florio would come break down the contract once the numbers come out. And you're yeah, like, and don't, and don't be looking, like, don't be looking <laughs> a lot like the initial tweet. Yeah, he ain't, he ain't making like he can make that, right. you know. Uh, the, the funniest one, I'm getting sidetracked, but it was so funny. I don't know if you guys all saw this. It was Tyron Smith's deal with the Jets. The base value is like six mil, and he's got like enough incentives to push it to 20. It's mm. insane. It's like, well, he can make 20, but he's probably yeah, just gonna like, make you start looking at like, those incentives, and it's like, come on. Like, dog. <laughs> Yeah, that 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 had me that had me roll. Anyway, let's get to Jerome. Uh, the, really, honestly, the, I want to frame the question on Jerome this way: In twenty twenty four, is Jerome Baker an upgrade over Bobby Wagner? In twenty twenty four, he is an upgrade over Bobby Wagner. I think, and this is where I'm glad that we're talking about Jerome Baker second because I think that this will kind of weave into a bigger conversation just about the linebacker room, right? Like I was looking at your tweet that you put out where you were, you know, when you asked or or posted the question about, you know, what was going on with Jordan Brooks's negotiation prior to him signing his deal in Miami. And I think if you're looking at Jerome Baker, if you're looking at Tyrell Dotson as signings um, in conjunction with, I think them trying to work out an extension with Jordan Brooks, maybe just like running out of time on that, you know, being able to compete with other offers on the market. I think if if you're looking at linebacker room of Jerome Baker, Tyrell Dotson and Jordan Brooks as your mic, you probably feel really strongly about that, right? We've got a guy that's a potential star in Brooks, somebody who we know can produce. You've got a guy like Jerome Baker that can do a few different things that you can kind of mix around. And then you've got a Dotson who you can kind of play as just like a box linebacker. You don't have to put a lot on his plate and he's a good rotational piece. Then you're probably leaving the off season feeling like, okay, we checked the box at this position. I think without a Brooks or without a bona fide high level linebacker, I'm looking more. I'm looking at Jerome Baker, uh, maybe with a little bit more of a question mark as to what you're going to get out of him this year, right? I think it's too much to ask him to be a Jordan Brooks replacement. Being better than Bobby, like you said, that I think fans will be happy with. I just think in the overall, we're going to hear probably in the midseason point, fans talking about how they have not really upgraded at the position because they don't have a centerpiece at linebacker and I don't think that Jerome Baker is for his athletic and for his how he was used in Vic Fangio's system last year um you know and he's been pretty productive over the last couple of years I don't think you're going to get another jump from him production wise in what ways is what the Seahawks can get from him better than what they would have got from Bobby if they had kept him in 2024 I mean athletically is really where it starts right like you know you can pull up the clips of Bobby and I know, I know it was tough for Seahawks fans to watch you know he just couldn't move as well with tight ends out in space. He couldn't handle the middle of the field as well as an underneath dropper. Jerome Baker is not like anybody's idea of a coverage savant, but he is a guy who ran, you know, a pretty good 40 when he was coming out. He is an undersized kind of light bodied, you know, kind of rangy type of guy. Um, So I think that you can probably feel a little bit better dropping that guy off in his own coverage underneath the slot receiver, underneath the tight end, matching up with the running back 
and feel like you've got a better chance dealing with those option routes, those underneath routes, slants and drags and all those things. Um, I, I think you would be happy with that. Again, I think that there's just kind of like a, a line or maybe a point of diminishing returns because you don't have a linebacker on the roster right now that can handle the big stuff that comes with playing soft zone coverage. Where do you see Jerome needs to think, where do you think Jerome needs to improve to take that next step? I would say it's like, it's one-on-one -on -one coverage situations, right? Like that's what, that's what makes a Fred. That's what makes a, um, that's what makes Fred Warner, Fred Warner. That's what makes peak Bobby Wagner, peak Bobby Wagner is that you can play all your soft zones, but if it's third and six and you need to play cover one, you can go stick that guy on their best guy on the interior and he can erase them, right? Like you think about Roquan Smith playing in Baltimore. That was the job is that, Hey, yes, he's a good run fitter. Yes. He's a good tackler. Um, yes. He can play well in soft zone coverage, but when it's third and five and he's got to go cover a tight end, he can go erase a tight end if he needs to. So that's where I think that kind of bar, that line between being a serviceable linebacker, which Baker is, and he is going to be a productive player in Seattle is my guess. And from being a pro bowl level linebacker. And I think that might be just like a step too far in expectations um, for him kind of filling, having to fill in more for Jordan than he would for Bobby. I think the Tyrell is probably going to be looked at a little bit more like Bobby's replacement. And even there, I think you're probably coming out more like average results, which I still think you'd probably be happy with. You know what I would love to be able to do is get like a genuine reaction from like Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay. Right. on like these linebackers because these are those are the guys who like they'll make you they'll make you need new linebackers exactly you know they will they will do that right away they'll sit I want if Shanahan's like oh they upgraded then I'd be like oh okay we might right. have some here if Shanahan's like I got something for them boys yeah <laughs> right, I'd, right. Be, I'd be a little worried because like you like you mentioned um yeah there was some my mentions would get a little ugly on game day sometimes with some Bobby slander and it would hurt my heart um, of course it would really you hurt know. my heart you know the mind when the mind is sharp, man, but the body ain't ain't as able as it used to be, man. It's always rough to watch with the veteran player. Yeah, I, we'll see. We'll see if the grass is greener in this in that regard too, because um, you still still got to go out there and play. So right. right, we'll see. But yeah, like there was some games that was yeah, not not, not great. great. But honestly, the whole defense was not great. So <laughs> they even got to make it one guy. But yeah, if these guys. If Tyrell and Jerome are upgrades, we'll see when they play the Rams. <laughs> <laughs> Big time. Exactly. Oh. Division, you will get a very clear evaluation of your linebacker. I hope that's – I hope Niners Seahawks is week one. We'll find out right off the jump. Uh, we're uh, we're going to talk some linebackers, uh, some drafty guys too, uh, but we'll, we'll stick with the one more free agent uh, addition here. Uh, I had a disclaimer, qualifier, whatever. Quandre was a friend of the show, uh, so – Seeing him get cut, we're a little biased, or at least uh, Chris, are you biased too? Because I am. I don't know if you are. I don't know if I'm as biased as you are, but I, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah, so I did, that one that that one hurt the Seahawks man to man podcast to to see that and uh, to see him get cut. Because when he so when he got cut, I'm like, all right, y'all better nail this replacement. What y'all right. about to do? Um, right. And so one of the, I don't know if they view Rayshon as like a. a one to one type of swap, but they did sign Rashawn Jenkins to a two year, twelve million dollar deal. It's basically the same deal they gave Julian Love the last off season. Uh, so he, he was he's strong safety, but looks like he played a little bit more single high stuff last year in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. From a little bit, I was able uh, to watch before we started recording. So Deontay, when you watch Rashawn, what stands out to you, both good and bad? Um, I would say good. Maybe this is just kind of like I, I don't want to waffle too much. I feel like all these guys, and maybe that's just the answer, is that all these guys are more fine than anything. Um, from a good, you know, what's good about him is that he does have pretty good range, right? Like that is a guy you could play in center field from time to time, and he can stay over the top of your of, a, of an offense and not give up big plays in the middle of the field, right? Like, and that's I think been been the story on him since he was playing for the Chargers a few years ago, right? And why I think that Jacksonville wanted to bring him in um, is that he's a guy you can do a few things, a few different types of things with. You can drop him in the box if you need to. He can play in the seam over a tight end if you want to play more of your split safety stuff. I was just looking at uh, John Schneider's quote that you mentioned uh, saying that they were, you know, kind of letting it slip that they might play a little bit more split safety going forward. I think that that's a guy you can play some quarters with, some cover four with. And he can handle, you know, lining up over a tight end and taking that guy away, you know, or sitting 
on a dig route from that Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay offense and be able to take that away. I, I think he's a smart player. I think that when you talk about the negatives or what the potential issues is are, I, I think it comes back again to like what a guy's ceiling is. I don't think that you're going to get somebody who's going to change the picture for an offense in the middle of the field, right? This is not somebody who's going to be in that deep third and a quarterback's going to say, okay, well, I'm not messing around with that part of the field because I know that he's he's got the ability to put his foot in the ground and take away space that I thought was there. I don't think you're getting that level of player. Um, again, like we're not talking about guys that are locked down man coverage players. This is somebody else who you would probably want playing man over a tight end, playing man over, you know, maybe the fourth best receiver on an offense. So, and, and I think it might work out having Witherspoon here, you know, having Tariq Willen here. Like, obviously, I think the corners room is pretty well set, especially in a defense like Mike McDonald's. Uh, but I don't think that you're going to get, you know, the, that breakout type of performance. I think it's kind of like a, he is who he is type of player, which is like, you know, capable of doing a few different things. Jack of all trades, maybe master of none is probably the way that I will put it. And what you said there is interesting because that's it's kind of been a dialogue locally just a little bit in that um, Seattle's used to, you know, that single high, you know, right. low safety, you know, it's off for so long with Earl. And then there was that little lull there where they didn't have it, picked up Quandre, and I was like, oh, we back. Well, you got a bat, right. And, and Quandre, that's like probably the best thing that probably is. The best thing he does is, you know, post and seams. That's that's his bag. Right. Uh, the question I'm opposed to you, I guess, is then in this world where it seems like everyone's doing the, the the too high thing to some degree whether they master in it or like just major in it mm -hmm. is is that skill set like a still at a premium i guess or is still as in, as important i guess or as necessary to have a center fielder in the way we we think of like an earl or a quandre in that regard i think it is i, I think that i think it is i think the issue is that now and this comes back to us talking about sean mcveigh kyle shanahan um, I think Zach Taylor is in this conversation. I think Ben Johnson is in this conversation. Um, Dave Canales is in this conversation. These guys who have been really good play callers over the last half decade or so. What we've learned is that offensive coaches have really mastered exposing the vulnerabilities in those coverages and mitigating, I think, the effect that a true center field picture changing safety um, can have on a game, right? Like if you're throwing those deep crossing routes, your safety is if an offense is doing it at the at the capacity that it can, this the best the safety can do is just make a tackle, right? Like you're not gonna see a guy undercutting that poor pick, right? You're not really gonna see that, you know, knockout blow, not just because of the rules, but just because of the amount of space that we're asking safeties to cover in today's NFL. So I think that there is a value in it. I think that the best situation is that you are maybe playing a little bit more of like your quarters types of defense under Mike McDonald, and now you have a guy like Jenkins layered behind someone like Tyrell Dotson, right? And now you're pro now you're protecting Dotson from having to play out in so much space or having to carry guys vertically or having to deal with, you know, a lot of that vertical stress that you're going to get from some of the offenses that you're going to see in the NFC and specifically in the NFC West, right? So I think Jenkins will be good for that. Again, it's just like from an effect on the game perspective, you're probably coming out more net neutral or maybe like slightly positive than somebody who, you know, a Kyle Shanahan is going into, um, you know, Monday doing this film study saying, I've got to do everything I can to make sure that this guy's not covering George Kittle or this guy's not mm -hmm. sitting on the dig for Brandon Ayuk. I don't know if he's that level of player, but I do think that he can have a positive impact. Oh, that's a positive sign. Okay. All right. Yeah, because I'm not going after that, Chris. I feel okay. Yeah. Cause up to this point, Mike and I were discussing on the podcast and off of it, we were unsure of Ray Sean and his ability to do the things that Quandre did because Quandre was one of those dudes where he's man in the middle of the field. The quarterback's not throwing it. And if you do throw it, he can make a play on it, interception. Oh, go ahead, Deontay. No, I'm saying, yeah, he's going to punish you for it if you, if you threw in his area. Like Exactly. Ray Sean so, can do that, I would say, like at just like a level beneath, right? He's just not as explosive an athlete. And in some sense... It makes sense. Wow. I just used that twice and it sounded <laughs> weird. Anywho, because the Seahawks are also looking to not have to have such a big cap hit with Quandre. And I don't right. know if they asked Quandre to take a – if they said, hey, we want to keep you. Is there any way we can do this, restructure, whatever the case may be? I'm not sure of those conversations. But 
I would at least have gone down that road. But if they were saying, you know what, we can get a younger guy. Well, actually, not a younger guy. We can get the same guy who just right. turned 30 and maybe the potential's there for him to get to that level in the next two seasons. But by then, he's going to be out with the Seahawks, I'd imagine. So I guess this is just a project to see if he can get it done. But I know a lot of people are wondering, when are you guys going to talk about the draft prospects? Because the Seahawks could use some depth at the linebacker position. And right. in this regard, I looked at the Athletics' top 100 big board and linebackers such as Edron Cooper out of Texas A&M, Junior Colson out of Michigan, Peyton Wilson out of North Carolina or NC State. Can they? Can any of these guys have a positive impact and compete for a starting role against some of the guys we just mentioned, Jerome Baker and Tyrell? Can they? Yeah. I, I think, you know, when, when Mike reached out to me and said this is what he wanted to talk about, this is just kind of a point that I've been talking with, you know, people about um, with not just this draft class, but the position in general. I think that we are entering a different era with linebacker play and linebacker mm. development. So when you're looking like a Peyton Wilson, right, it's, I think it's easy to look at the 40 time and see the size, see the fact like, okay, he is in that 240 range and think, all right, let's drop him in. A guy that athletic should be a positive ad, somebody who can compete to play right away. I think that the league now has gotten so skilled at attacking young linebackers. Jordan Brooks being a great example. Like I remember, I think – my first year at PFF was the year that Jordan Brooks had a ton of tackles, right? It was like first year playing full-time starter. I think he had like 120 tackles or some ridiculous number like that. And like, okay, young player, really productive. Let me go watch. And then you start watching him on passing downs. And it's like the athleticism is there, the knowledge of the game, the reps that you need to have banked to understand what an offense is trying to do to you, how they're manipulating space. That wasn't all the way there yet. And it took some time, I think, to grow into the player that he's ultimately become and what I think he can continue to be. I don't know if you're going to get drop him in, drop him in the league right now. And you got an impact player, at least not with a guy like Peyton Wilson, because I don't think he's ready yet as a run fitter. You don't see enough physicality. Same with like Edron Cooper, right? Really good athlete, guy who can range between the hashes, between the numbers. I, I like a lot of what I see in terms of movement skills. You don't see a guy who's who can play like Fred Warner does, and you get that the second that the ball is snapped, he is shooting the B gap, shooting the A gap, and he's meeting the guy at the line of scrimmage just as well as he's playing that kind of middle hole in cover two. And, and I just don't know if there's any guy in this class that can do that, especially not early in their career. Um, so I would say if you're getting the Peyton Wilson, getting the Edger and Cooper, you're probably inheriting a little bit more of a project. That's something where it's like, all right, year three, year four, the way that, you know, Patrick Queen got better the last two years with Mike McDonald, you want to take that track with those type of players. I think maybe the, the guy who's most ready to play now, in my opinion, at that position is Junior Colson. But I think that with him, it's more high floor. He's going to be like your Jerome Bakers. He's going to be like your Tyrell Dotson. He's not going to make a bunch of mistakes. He is going to be a pretty proficient tackler, but you're not going to get that game-changing range. You're not going to get a guy who can play the mic and take away the middle, that underneath middle of the field area um, in the way that you would see from an elite level linebacker. So uh, that's where I think he gets a little bit tricky. Okay. So you can say it, Deontay. The game we love is gone. That's all. It is. It where's, is. The, where, where's the 245 pound guys with the neck roll, you know, dumping over the, they're gone. Gone, man. gone and they're probably not coming back. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not. I, I'm working on this project that's required me to, to go revisit some like old Seahawks teams. And I, I was working on something on cam recently and cam came out at I think two th cam Chancellor came out at two thirty one I think out of Virginia tech. And it's just like, man, I'm looking at some of these safeties now. Oh man. 212, 215, 208. Oh my goodness. That's considered good size today. Yeah. KJ Wright was two forty six I think coming out of Mississippi state. Like he was so big that at the senior bowl, they asked him to do like pass rush stuff. And he right. sucked. Um, <laughs> to, to this day, he still thinks that's what kind of tanked his draft stock a little bit. Um, but like he was, he was a big dude, two forty six. Right. Bobby, I think was two forty two. Right. Coming out of Utah state. And yeah, it's just, that's all right. The game. It, it's, I blame Shanahan really at McVay, you know, even if it's not their fault. I mean, it's, it's yeah, exactly. I think they're responsible for that evolution in defense, and I think that we're just in a tricky spot at that position. You know, it's hard to find guys who can play right now. 
And it's also unfair that Shanahan gets to be part of the problem and he gets Fred Warner. Right. Like, exactly. what? Like, what? Like, come on, bro. You got, you're the problem and on your team you have the answer. You know, um, I don't know if y'all if y'all watch the boondocks, but Kyle Shanahan got, kind of gets to be that waiter when Tom gets his girl took by Usher. It's like, <laughs> we'll let that happen to me, though. Because <laughs> I, I got Green Law and I got Fred Warner. I don't got y'all problems, man. Oh, Great no, pool. <laughs> That's, it's, it's so unfair, man. Like seeing what he what they did in the playoffs, I think two years ago to the Cowboys. And right. then seeing Fred be able to turn and like run with CD Lamb up the middle, and it's just like, bro, come on, bro. Ain't right. That's ain't not. Right. That's 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 not that's not fair, man. Uh, I want to follow up on Junior real quick because he has become like a kind of one of those Seahawks. Like, ooh, we should take that guy. You know, every year teams have their their guy. Part of it is just the need for linebackers. Right. Part of it is just like Michigan was super hot this year. They right. played the Huskies in the national championship, so fans got to kind of see fans of Seattle kind of got to know that Michigan roster a little bit. Mike right. McDonald, obviously coached at Michigan. So there's all this, this stuff right. with him in particular. The Seahawks are in a tricky spot. They have picked 16. They don't pick again until 81. Right. They're in a weird range there. Can they get Colson with the, with the 80? Or do you think they'd have to trade back and get him somewhere sandwiched in the middle of those two picks? I think if you're in the when you're in the 80th range, that's when I think it's a little bit tighter. I, I think that you would have to kind of be wishing for a best case scenario. If they were able to maybe find a way into the low 70s, then I think you're in a better position. If you're talking like in the second round, beginning a third, I think that's a good range. And then I think if you're, you know, high 60s, mid 50s, that might be a little bit too rich for Colson. And I think that that's just, again, that's just kind of like this draft in general. It is really tricky trying to find ranges on guys that are not your dead set top 50 types. There's definitely like a cliff between the obvious impact level players and the guys who are really just going to kind of be more like quality role player guys, which is how I see Colson for as much as I like what he does with this game. I don't think you're, you're getting a star out of that guy. You're probably getting just like quality starter role player type. That's a guy you probably want to take towards the end of the second round. So if there's a way to kind of get back into that range, then you should feel good about it. If not, then it's like, I don't know, because I do think that Peyton Wilson and Edron Cooper are going to go probably pretty early in the second because they move so well, they test so well, and the tape looks like they have pretty good range. A guy like Colson might kind of fall a bit behind those guys, but I think that the run on linebackers is probably happening in the second round. So it would be in their best interest if they could find a way to maybe give up some later draft capital um, to try to package some things up to maybe get in that 70 range, 65 to 70 range. You might have a better opportunity to get a guy like Colson there. You alluded to it. But I want to make sure I'm not putting words in your mouth, Deontay. And as you were talking about linebackers, you said you just talked about the speed in which these linebackers are. And there's no more neck rolls, as Mike alluded to as well. So I'm just going to ask straight up with the NFL becoming driven by talented wide receivers now. Have you I'm assuming you've noticed the difference in all those linebackers builds? For sure. I mean, for sure. Like, I, you know, like um, Mike was just pointing out with weights for for Bobby and KJ, like even those guys the conversation I remember at that point in time, especially for a Bobby is man, it's kind of rare to find a guy who can move like that. Right. You know? and, and that was the sales pitch for, for Bobby, you know, otherwise if we, if people would have known what he could do as a run defender as well as playing in coverage, he wouldn't have been available when he got picked, <laughs> <laughs> Right. you know, to do would have been a top 20 pick. Right. So that, you know, that's just kind of the way it works. I think, I do think the guys builds are changing. Um, the sizes that we're used to seeing playing inside backer are playing on the edge now, you know, for these three, four defenses that 255, you know, type of range, 250 to 255 type of range, that strong safety build that uh, Mike was mentioning with the Cam Chancellor types, those are the guys playing linebacker, right? You want to see a guy who's, you know, 235, 230, and can run sub four, six. <laughs> if you can find that, great. But the issue is, to me, the issue is, the guys who are that level of athlete, you'll go and watch the tape. And because the college game is so different than the pro game, there's really not a lot that translates, right? At that level, they're dealing with all this spread offense, RPOs being thrown five, eight yards downfield with the guard that's right in your chest because they don't have, you know, illegal downfield blocking rules the way that you do in the league. So there's just so much of a learning curve. It's not just the body types. It's just kind of like the switching mentality because what you have to deal with in the spread game, 
you've also got to deal with the fact that there's a 330 pound guard where they can line up in 11 personnel and run outside zone at you. Mm. And that's just as much a problem as having to deal with play action and having to deal with the drop back passing game, right? And linebackers are not being challenged in that kind of way at the college level. So for Wilson, for Cooper, for Colson, for Jeremiah Trotter, who I think is a guy who people might've been higher on before this season, I think now he's probably a little bit more just like your plugger type. I, I think that these guys have a long learning curve before they become the players that they can be, because all of them are athletic enough to be good players, just probably not right away. So what what I what this conversation now makes me think is, do we maybe get to a point where it cycles back? And the reason I, I bring that up is because I'm looking at the Rams and how mm-hmm. McVay has kind of changed his offense not necessarily stretching you out as much and then they do it but like look what look what they did last year running it right at folks and then look what they just did invested in guards so you know like it feels like mcveigh sat there and said oh y'all putting these 232 pound backers out there huh mm-hmm. all right give me these 300 pound <laughs> yeah, i got give some me, for you <laughs> yeah give me, give me a man from tcu a villa give me uh dots give me jackson you know I'm, right. give, me, give me these big guards and now we're about to run it at y'all you know, mm-hmm. y'all can be trading street for speed for power. Right. Do, uh, do you think maybe with that, do you think we, we cycle back to uh, getting back to uh, maybe bigger guys at the LB spot at some point? I don't know. Bigger. I wouldn't say bigger. I think that what we're going to see is I think you hear a lot about on the offensive side. Hey, you want to build your wide receiver room like a basketball team, right? You want a guy who can go create somebody who can slash somebody who can play over the top. I think you're going to see more of that at the linebacker position. I don't, I try not, I've done it maybe five times already, but I, I swear I try not to use San Francisco as a reference point because nobody's <laughs> going to have two all pro linebackers. Like that's just not normal to have two all pro level linebackers um, on your team. But when you think about the differences between Dre Greenlaw, who was like a monster run defender, but great at tackling his space. And then you've got a guy like Fred, who is more of your coverage first type of guy. I think that you're going to see teams really looking at hyper-specific roles for linebackers in this defense. And like we talked about with free agency, I think that's what Seattle was going for. Was let's try to bring let's try to bring Jordan back. Obviously, that didn't work out. But if you do that, now you have Jerome Baker maybe more as your utility backer. And now you can say, hey, Tyrell Dotson, we're only going to bring you in when teams are going heavier personnel, right? If we want to play that old school 4-3 under defense, you're going to be that Sam backer in our under front playing close to the line of scrimmage, helping us strike guys. So that way Baker and Brooks can play a little bit more freely and range around. So I think that, you know, without, without having that kind of centerpiece Mike backer, the way that we talk about X receivers on offense, it gets a little bit harder. And now I think the conversation for Seattle really should be, can you go get a guy like Cooper DeGene to go play safety next to Rayshon Jenkins? And you try to use your two safeties to kind of patch over some issues that you might have at the linebacker position. Cause they've got to find a way, I think, to protect the guys that have a linebacker right now from how explosive offenses can be in the play action and drop back passing game. I'm sorry. Did Mike send you our podcast one sheet that shows, you know, the order and what we're doing things? We're jumping right into safeties and you literally just gave us a little gem on what the Seahawks can do. So I'll just ask you, can they find a rookie to come in and maybe not be a game changer, but come in and be effective? I know you saw what Spoon did. I'm not saying can the Seahawks get that again, because that's that's very hard to do. But can they come in and get a guy that's just content his rookie season and can build off of that? I think if you're looking for immediate contributors at safety is Cooper DeGene. That's that I would say that's the one guy in this class that you can say like sight unseen, drop him into any defense, whether you're playing the old school Legion of Boom, cover three everything, or you're playing your Mike McDonald, hey, split safety, we're changing the picture at the last second all the time. That's a guy who can do that. I think once you leave, once you leave the conversation with the DeGene and you start looking at the rest of the class. Guys like Javon Bullard, who I think will be available later, like that's a guy I think in the 80s you might you might be able to go get um, that you might be interested in. Um, you know, can do everything. Versatile guy, plays physically. He can play in the box. He can play as a big nickel. Um, you know, you can use him as a blitzer. Not necessarily a middle of the field player. That's somebody that you might be interested in. Cameron Kitchens um, from Miami. That's kind of like your hammer safety coming down with bad intentions to go help you fit the run. 
that's maybe a guy they might be interested in. Um, but he's kind of playing more in a locked role than a guy that can, you can kind of use two or three different ways. And then, you know, outside of that, you're talking about projections and development. So like Kalen Bullock to me has been somebody that I've really been pounding the table on um, as a young player, got a lot of range, good speed, great ball skills, forced a bunch of turnovers. And he's only like, he's 20 right now, won't be 21 until after the draft, but he's light. The kid's light, not there yet as a run defender, not there yet as a tackler. And I don't think, I don't know if Seattle's going to be in a position where they can wait two to three years for a guy to get his NFL body and really be prepared to go play um, high level, you know, run fitting, plus being able to handle the middle of field football. So th- those are the guys that I've been most interested in. You know, Nubin from Minnesota is another guy in the conversation. I've probably fallen a little bit out of love with him. And I think if you have Rayshon Jenkins, you're probably not looking at Nubin as as closely because I think it's kind of duplicative between those two. Uh, but that that's maybe the list and about where I'd stop um, on the guys that I'm most interested in. Okay, so with Cooper, he's mm-hmm. white. White DB plays corner. Yeah. It, so we got the death of the white corner still. We're keeping that death going. We can't get Cooper to revive the, revive the feeling. Maybe keep him at corner in the NFL. When I was at so when I was in Indy, like I didn't, I wasn't working on anything to publish off of it. I was more just kind of like curious to talk with NFL people about it. I was like, man, maybe I'm missing something, right? Like when I watch, <laughs> I'm like, this is an outside corner to me. This is playing press man to man, playing press quarters. And he's erasing guys. And then I'm talking with guys, and it was almost like it was the most dismissive responses I could have possibly gotten from NFL people. I'm like, hey, how do you feel about Cooper? Oh, you mean the safety? No, I'm talking about the guy that plays corner. I don't know. He's going to play in the slot and safety. And I'm like, why? <laughs> you know? And I think that, uh, and then it's horrible because while it's true, it definitely plays into stereotypes for a DB, for a DB of his complexion. Great, you know. Great head for the game. He's always so well prepared. He knows what the offense is doing. It's so cerebral. You know, he's so <laughs> versatile. You don't ever hear people talk about the fact that he was like, a, he's been a freak athlete at basically everything he's done in his life. So, like, that's just been a funny part of this process. But he could play corner if he needed him to. I just think the NFL has decided we want that guy playing closer to the line of scrimmage for reasons I don't think I understand. But I still think the guy can be an all pro, pro bowl level player at safety. Wow, man. Iowa just can't get one, man. They they, they, they tried they it with tried Riley. It. They gave us Riley. Miller Moss last year, came out and ran a good 40, and nobody believed. And now they got the even better version of Cooper DeGene, and it feels like the NFL is like, nah. <laughs> They're not going to let them get one. I even I, I told Riley this. Uh, I went to the Senior Bowl last year. It was my first mm-hmm. time. I remember watching him. Uh, and I, you know, I don't really watch a lot of college ball, so I was just kind of filling out guys. But I could he was wearing shorts, so I could see his legs. And I was like, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, time out. Who is number th- – I think he was like 33 or something like that, senior bowl. Yeah. I said, who's 33 on the national team or whatever? Riley Moss from Iowa. Google. I said, yo. I forget. I think I was sitting next to Alec Lewis, who's our Vikings writer. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure that's what I was sitting next to. And I was like, yo, y'all see this Riley Moss kid? It's a white corner over there. Uh, and I didn't do any work, I don't think, at the senior bowl really on prospects. But I remember I went down to the field. I said, what up to Deion Henley? You know, go Cougs. And then I found Riley. I said, Riley, man – Keep doing your thing. <laughs> and now you're talking to him like we be talking to each other. And you're fighting a good fight, brother. Yeah, I can feel it. And, and, you know, I didn't know at the Senior Bowl they, they they clock like the fastest speeds on the GPS. And I think he yeah. hit like 20 miles an hour. He was like the fastest time of the day. This was like the first or second day of practice. So I'm like, yo, they're going to move that. They're going to move that kid. Mm-hmm. They're going to move him. I think the Broncos took him. And yep, the Broncos took him. Yeah. Safety, Riley Moss, University of Iowa. I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, no chance. But if, <laughs> if Cooper gets announced as a safety uh, when they when they call his name, it's going to hurt my heart. I'm going to understand it because now I'm rooting for the guys. Now, exactly. Now you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we got to break We got to break these glass ceilings, man. Oh, man. It's, it's, it's so stereotypical. It's, but it's funny. It's a it's a funny plight. <laughs> it is. Right? It's like, these guys are good athletes. You know? Right. To be able to, to, to play a corner in the league, in theory. Uh, I want to follow up on Nubin real quick because he is a yeah. guy. He's another one. If Colson's that Seahawkee, let's take him this year for linebackers. I would say Nubin probably is for the for this fan base, unless you're like Cougs, like me and Chris are, then maybe it's like, ooh, pick up Jaden Hicks. Jaden you know? Hicks is interesting too, yeah. 
you know what? Let's go with Hicks first then, because go Cougs. Um, where would where would he kind of fit in uh, Mike McDonald's scheme? So I think again, that's like a utility guy, right? Like the thing I like about Hicks is that for being, you know, for for the size that he is, he moves really well. You know, I I, I need to go. Let me see what he did. Let's see what his times were. I can't remember off the top of my head how he tested. When you watch the film, you see a rangy defensive back, right? A guy who's physical, a guy who wants to play in your face. So I would say, like, if there weren't – if Devin Witherspoon was not already a Seahawk, I would say go get that guy and he can be your big nickel, right? He could go be your blitzer off the edge the way that McDonald would use a Kyle Hamilton. Not, not comparing one-to-one because Hamilton might be the best safety in the league right now. Um, but that's a guy you could use like in that type of role that can maybe play deep and, you know, line up over tight ends and help erase guys in that type of way. I love his physicality. I love his tackling ability. Um, and you got to love the size, right? Like you don't get many opportunities to go get a guy that tall, that big playing that position. Um, especially a guy who has a little bit of athleticism. So I would say that's another guy, maybe third round, third round ish that you can go get. So I do think there are going to be a lot of options for Seattle to maybe kind of fill some extra needs on the defense around him. And I, I would imagine, I'm sure you guys would both agree that that's gonna, this is going to be an aggressive draft for them defensively trying to bring in young talent. I, that's another guy I think you might be interested in if, you know, you don't get a chance at DeGene and maybe, you know, Junior Colson goes ahead of when you get access to him. You can go get a guy like Hicks and kind of move him around the rest of your defense, um, whether it be a big nickel and you play spoon more outside or you want to play that guy deep next to Rayshon, play Rayshon more in the middle of the field and play uh, play a guy like Jaden Hicks closer to the line of scrimmage. That's an option for you as well. Okay. Man, Chris, I'm I'm happy they got Leonard Williams, right? Because he's a really good player at a position that they, they needed, right? But man, this would it just the more and more we listen to, you know, I hearing what Deontay's saying, reading some stuff. This really is the wrong draft to not have a second round pick. <laughs> 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 based on what they need this would be the time to have like instead of even having a first have like three thirds in a second you right. know like, this would be the, the draft for that instead you got pick 16 to pick 81 they're gonna be sitting there bored ordering pizza for the back half of the first round and all, right. through, the all the way through the second oh, well man. the interesting thing too for them is that like in this case in a lot of cases for a team in this position you would say hey just trade down and accumulate more draft capital but I think they need a defensive playmaker too. And yes. I think you know, the draft range they're in, being in the late teens of the first round, like I don't that pick's a little too valuable for what they need defensively to hand it away. So they're they're kind of in between like a rock and a hard place from a decision making perspective. So I don't envy what John Schneider has to, you know, make do with. Um, but yeah, I think they've got to find a way to move up, even if it's only marginally from the 80s, to try to get access to some of the better defensive players at linebacker and safety. Yeah, agreed. And that's before we even talk about their their O-line. Right, you know, exactly. That's a, that's, a, that's a podcast for another another day. Uh, why, did, why have you cooled on Newbin from Minnesota? I think, again, well, let me own this first. It might be a bit of prospect fatigue, right? Like, Newbin's been kind of a known commodity for basically like the last three years at Minnesota. Um, and when I look at, like, you're not going to get – to me, I think I've cooled on him because he's not that top-flight athlete. Right. I think he's a pretty good playmaker, good tackler, very versatile in coverage. A um, guy who plays the ball decently, maybe not as great as I would like for a guy as experienced as he is. Um, but then I look at other guys and you start looking at upside and trying to project. And to me, I would rather have, you know, in a vacuum, I would rather have a guy like Caleb Bullock, like I mentioned. Right. I would rather have a guy like Jaden Hicks, like I mentioned, guys who have better size, in my opinion at similar athletic profiles, if not better, and guys that I think that I can maybe turn into a more versatile player. I, I just think that you're maybe getting um, a player who's closer to a ceiling in Tyler Newbin than you would at some of the other young safeties that are coming into the draft. This is generally – well, I don't want to speak for Chris. I've generally been pessimistic uh, this offseason based on free agency, um, some of the coaching hires, mostly because – when I watch Mike McDonald and the Ravens, I'm like, ooh, okay. Not just Mike McDonald's cooking, but I've been around football enough to know, like, okay, some of these position coaches have to be cooking as well. For some right. guys to have these seasons, you know, whether it's a Gino or, or a Kyle or Matabuke or even what they were able to get out of Kyle Van Noy and, and, and Clowney. I'm like, right. and just one dude just 
it hit the button and turned all this up. So then Mike McDonald gets hired and just brings no one with him. I'm like, right. huh, that was a little weird. I don't, I can't remember the last time I've seen a guy like compare that to like Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn got the commander's job and just scrolled through his call log. And if he had the number, he called you, whether it was yeah. to play for him or it was to coach with him. He just right. called the office. He said, pull up to D.C. It's, it's, it's up. And Mike McDonald was like, no, I'm going to do a, a real meritocracy, which is fine. You know, right. we got enough nepotism as is. But it's like, ooh, okay, you already a first-time head coach. You got a bunch of dudes you don't even know like that. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I'm a little biased on the Quandre thing. I'm a little biased on the Bobby side. But either way, objectively, I'm like, mm, did you really upgrade the linebacker spot losing Jordan? Um, but yeah, I feel a little better today now. I, f- I feel I feel a little better. I feel like they got, they got be okay. Things will be okay. Not to cut you off. I think things will be okay. But I think that again, the message to leave this with is that I, I don't clearly this clearly John Schneider is the one making the decisions, right? Because there wasn't any there weren't big pushes to go get um, you know, high profile names that would immediately fix some of the issues defensively. And I think that, you know, to the point that to the degree that Schneider and McDonald are collaborating, I think that they're looking at this, like, we need to approach the retooling on a two year window on a two year timeline, not a one year timeline. Right. Like, I think the idea is, Hey, let's hold serve. Let's just get serviceable pros in here because they know they got to draft so many rookies. Um, on the defensive side of the ball. So I think that they're just trying to like, you know, hedge a bet and not have to force young guys to have to go be contributors so early. That's such a tough division. Um, and then maybe I think you'll see if they find a way to kind of get get some money open next offseason, get a lot of money open next offseason, that might be where we see them take bigger swings, right? It is you get another year to evaluate Gino if he continues to show that he's a quarterback that I think that everybody in this podcast thinks that he is and can be. Um, which is a guy that you can get to the playoffs and be competitive in the playoffs with, then I think they may take a big swing um, in year two of this regime. So I, I, that's kind of the way that I'm looking at it, is they're playing it safe right now um, and, and trying to play out the string, bring in some young guys, and then maybe take bigger swings in the next offseason, which is probably the right move. No, It's just that nobody's going to feel gratified about making moves like this right now. Yeah, particularly if you're on probably on Pete Carroll's staff and you're looking like, well, damn, we could have treaded water. Wow, we could have done this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's which, exactly. which is fair. But also, I could get why John's like, yeah, but we need to go above that a little bit. Yeah. So, we yeah. step back, step forward. You know, hopefully, I, as you alluded to, we are, this is a pro Geno podcast yeah. as well. So, I'm hoping that they give him the support he needs to get right. it done. There was too many. I reviewed some Geno tape the other night, and I was like, yo, man, get my man aligned. If you get right. my man aligned, He'll be all right. Yeah, man, because he he's tough. And we're not gonna make this a Gino show, but like Gino was standing in there and getting his butt kicked. Exactly. <laughs> it was still like DK there, so meow. exactly you make it happen. It's like uh, I know we fall in love with some of the draft prospects, but it's it's di- the pass protection is different at the at the pro level, man. Right. You're not going Michael Pennis can't bring his line with him. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He can maybe bring like one or two. One dudes. guy. Right. Yeah, that but you can't bring the whole thing. It's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be different now, you know. So even if they lose Aaron the Rams losing Aaron Donald, it's still they just loaded up and drafted two more guys who can get to the passer. Exactly. Sean McVay. Uh that that was that was that that was everything, man. Deontay, man, your insights are always you. so much appreciated, man. We I learned. appreciate y'all for having me, man. So Absolutely. much good measure take whether one way or the other if we're down on something you can get us back to center if we're high on somebody can get it that's what we need you know we need the, we need the balance you know? that's what i'm here for man voice of reason voice of you reason got, See? You, got any, you got anything you want to plug any mock drafts out any recent stories out that you know um is- i would say i mean anybody wants to go back and look at the mock draft that i did um last week you know i would definitely invite you to do so um obviously some of that stuff is kind of outdated because free agency came and i think filled some of the needs that we were talking about um with with teams when i did that mock um, i'm working on you know more draft evaluation stuff and to be talking about edge rushers and corners um that's something i've done every year that i've been working at the athletic or really just every year i've been talking about the draft i was talking about the premium positions on defense um and then i'll probably be around you know throughout the month of april on the athletic um, talking, you know, on the podcast with the football show with with uh, Mays and Tice and Dame Brugler as as they prepare for the NFL draft. So all the same places that you usually get me at, and then whatever is next down the line, we'll talk about that when we get an opportunity to talk about it. Love, 
Thank you again, Deontay. We appreciate it, man. Enjoy. It looks like it's sunny out in Cali, man. What's the weather I'm, looking like out there? I'm trying, I'm trying to appreciate it while I can, man. It's been real rainy. We just broke the 70s again, so I think that the winter is finally officially behind us. So, yeah, I think I'm going to find something, something to do where I can go be outside. Well, let's spring into the summer. We're just going to get right into it, get some nice yep. weather here. It's Seattle's looking a little nice. We had some good weather recently. So, again, thank you, Deontay. We appreciate you hopping on and giving us some insight. And, again, as Mike said, get being the middleman. We we are understanding what the Seahawks are trying to do. The vision's not clear, but with having you on, I'm starting to understand, okay, this could be a two-year window. And that's that's what we needed. So, thank you again. Appreciate you, man. Thank you guys for having me. We'll catch you guys next time. Peace.